And believe me, not everybody sees wiggly lines all that well. Somebody that doesn't have a very good intact spatial perceptual area, probably not going to be a really good EEG tech. You know? And in our lab, you can pretty well predict who is going to become a good tech fairly quickly uh, based on a few simple things. We used to print it on paper. And the paper would be running along. And uh, when you turn off the machine, if it was a good tech, they were focused on the paper. And very much like driving forever, you come to a stop, you think you're going backwards. Well, one of the things, when they turn off the paper, if they didn't slap their hand onto the paper real quick, they weren't really paying attention. Because you get the illusion that the paper is being sucked back into the machine. You've seen it flowing along. When you stop it, it looks like it's going backwards. And if I don't see the tech within the first week or so go onto the paper, I don't figure he's going to be a good tech because he wasn't really focused. The, the, the f streaming of the EEG hadn't become background. They were still seeing everything as foreground. They'll never really get it. You know? And the other symptom was I'd ask them about two or three weeks into their training whether they'd had their EEG dreams yet. And if they look at you, my God, how could you tell I was having EEG dreams? Well, uh, sleep, REM sleep is like consolidation of memories. So if you start seeing EEGs in your sleep, um, all you're doing is consolidating the image of the morphology that you were seeing the day before. So literally, if, if they have EEG dreams and the, the slapping down on the paper is, as an EEG tech, one of the most difficult things on these big writer units is threading the paper up through all the rollers. And if, if, you, think you're, you, know, if you think your paper is about to slip back down into the machine, if you, you tear it and it's going to slide back in, the first thing you want to do is stop that paper from disappearing because as soon as it's sucked back in, you've got about 10 minutes of threading paper up through the, the, the rollers, uh, the, the tensioners. So um, literally those two things would tell me really quickly whether they were really focused visually on what they were doing and encoding it. And um, uh, so uh, here, the nesting of gamma uh, ends up predicting level of consciousness. And uh, when it's totally lacking in nesting, uh, you can assume that they're basically not conscious. Um, the other thing is that gamma doesn't always come in brief bursts. Gamma can be pathological. This is not something that's usually discussed by the vendors who are selling you gamma trainers. Uh, John Cowan's got a little device that, that he sells that teaches people how to do gamma. And he says gamma is this great thing. It's like a value judgment about an EEG rhythm. Come on. You know, it's an EEG rhythm, not a good or a bad. I mean, it, it's just a rhythm, damn it. You know, it could be good, could be bad. De depends. It's like situational ethics, you know. And it, it depends. It could be good, could be bad. Gamma that's persistent happens when a neural network is bound but doesn't unlock. Like in Parkinson's disease. Gee, if gamma is so great, why is it persistent in Parkinson's disease? Why is it also more, per, more present in Alzheimer's disease, where neural networks are bound and locked up? I mean, uh, because it's not a healthy rhythm at that point. Neural network dynamics normally lock and unlock. If you've got a network that's not working, it could lock up, in which case gamma is going to be going and going and going and going, like a continuously ringing bell. So if you see gamma ongoing, you're pretty well assured that that's not a healthy thing. You know, gamma should occur in brief packets to be healthy. The bispectral index. Remember I mentioned the bispectrum. Well, they can be plotted out like this, where this axis is 5 to 35 hertz. This axis is 5 to 35 hertz. Now, they're not looking at DC. It could go from 0 to 40 and they would be able to see slow cortical potentials in gamma be a lot more interesting. But in this display, uh, this is work by Linus uh, using MEG, and this is a Parkinson's patient with an excess of, of non-45 degree angle line. This is a normal person with a little bit of interaction between 10 hertz and 20 hertz. So these are harmonics here. You normally expect to see 10 hertz related to 10 hertz, you know, 17 hertz related to 17 hertz. So you expect things on this line, but you don't expect things off of the line to be very big. 
in patients, you see big divergences off the 45 degree angle line. Uh, again, this is a Parkinson patient with neural networks that have locked up and cross spectral relationships that are excessive. This is um, controls, uh, the average of all controls, and this is the average of all patients regardless of diagnosis. And you basically see that there's more bispectral spread in the patient population than in the normative population, which is essentially this with more subjects. So you'll see simple harmonics as little outliers, but when you see this, these big flares, you're seeing cross-spectral correlation that's excessive. And uh, uh, the, the bispectral relationship like this can be used clinically. Um, obviously, it's being used by Linus, who's a fairly famous uh, 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 out of the Northeast in the U.S. And if you order the PowerPoint presentation, you'll end up with a few pages of uh, references uh, pretty much all the way through the presentation. Every statement that was made had a reference because when I present a model like this that's theoretical, you want to reference everything because somebody's going to want to have a question about some piece of it. And I, I wanted to benchmark every single statement in it. I presented the model one time just as the model without all of the references and um, it, it became rather obvious that people wanted um, each piece of this model uh, highlighted with the data that you know, the, the publications that um, uh, formed it. So uh, if you email me, um, Q-E-E-G-J, surprise, huh? uh, at sbcglobal.net, uh, I'll be more than happy to send you the PowerPoint with all of the slides in it.